Okay, so we're officially recording. Okay, thank you. My name is Alicia Walker, and I am calling this meeting to order as co-chair. Governor Baker's March 12th order suspending certain provisions of the open meeting law allow us to hold this virtual meeting of the working group. Given that we have a quorum present, I am calling the May 12th, 2021 meeting of the Community Safety Working Group to an order at 5.50 p.m. I will call upon each member of the working group by name. At that time, they should unmute their mic and say present. This will indicate that, that they can hear me and that we can hear them. Please remember to mute your mic after saying present. Um, Ms. Pat Ananabaku? Present. Ms. Deborah Ferreira? Present. Mr. Ress Vernon Jones? Present. Okay. Um, I want to take a couple of minutes to review the agenda. We will first hear any public comment that members of the public want to provide to the working group. We will not respond to your comments, but we will listen to your comments carefully. And then we will hear from reparations for Amherst for the first half of the meeting. We will then discuss, thank you. We will then discuss the upcoming deadlines for our work. I will also leave time to open the floor to group members that want to suggest organizations that the group believes are critical to meet with before we finish our charge. Next, we will leave time to hear from the subcommittee working on the presentation for the town council, specify the length of our presentation and time for questions and answers, and also to whom we want to present our recommendations. Lastly, we will decide on the time to meet with the finance committee. Our first order of business is the public comment section of the agenda. If any members of the public would like to make a statement, please raise your hand. I will recognize you and ask Ms. Moisson to turn on your mic. I ask that comments be limited to no more than three minutes. The working group will not respond to your comments, but we will be listening intently. Okay, I don't think I see any hands. Um, should I give it a couple of more minutes? Do you see any hands, Ms. Moiston? Okay, um, so it does look like we have someone um, wanting to public comment. Uh, can you please bring Mrs. Demetria Shabazz in? Hello, can you all hear me? Yes. Yes. So I'm speaking as a member of the public now, but of course uh, with uh, knowledge of what has transpired. And again, I just thank the CSWG for all of your hard work um, and Ms. Moiston in attending each meeting and serving as staff liaison for the town. Um, and it sounds like you all are um, trying to figure out other groups to meet with. I urge you to meet with the different services in the town, such as Craig's Doors. I did meet with them. Uh, we were unable to do a full report on Craig's Doors, Amherst uh, connections uh, headed by uh, Wei Ling, um, and Craig's Doors headed by Kevin Noonan. We also met with the CDH. I believe uh, that basically they run the crisis hotline. Um, they have different perspectives to share about how they interact with the police. For the most part, it was positive. However, they do have ideas in how to improve. And uh, when we discussed the possibility of the CRUST program, they were very enthusiastic. So I think it would be to uh, your benefit, to the town's benefit, if you all met with them, uh, even if it was just 30 minutes to 45 minutes, to talk about uh, ideas as you uh, shape and then meet with the Finance Committee about the possibility of CRUST. Thank you, Mrs. Shabazz. Um, do we have anybody else looking to public comment?
Okay. So if we don't have any other public comments, I'll move on to the next section. This is the time for members to update us on any work that they are doing or any events that are coming up. Does anybody, um, any members of our group have any events or information to share with us? Mr. Vernon Jones? I wanted to let the group know that after our meeting last week, uh, I strongly urge the town manager uh, to consider reducing the budgeted police department sworn officer positions to 43 and putting all of the uh, rem remaining money uh, into CRESS. Um, I also had an opportunity today to speak with Amos Irwin, uh, who is the co-author of that report that was shared with our group uh, early on about the community responder model. Um, and he was tremendously helpful. And <clears throat> I think with him and the town manager and the police chief, they now are have entered discussions to have um, the uh, law enforcement at action project, I think it's called, um, do a review of um, <clears throat> the history of calls to the, to the APD, uh, they used 2019, so it's a pre-pandemic year, uh, and they're able to come up with some estimate of how many calls might be handled by uh, a program like CRESS uh, if they have some criteria from us. Um, and he was also tremendously helpful with all kinds of questions. One of the reasons I ended up asking him questions is that it seems to me that at one point the town manager said to us, give us the basic outline of the kind of program you want and the town staff will work out the details. More recently, I've heard from some town councilors and maybe even from the town manager that we can't move forward quickly because we don't have the details worked out. Um, so Amos, you know, I, <clears throat> he actually has a little history in Amherst. I think he went to Amherst College, so he's got a little connection to Amherst, but he has done work across the country, and they not only studied these programs, but they also have worked with various municipalities to help bring the, the uh, community responder programs uh, into being. And they're able to provide this uh, quite a bit of basic service free of charge. Uh, and then if we want, there's an additional piece that they might be able to help with for a charge. So I learned a lot about the program and I do think over the next, that before we meet with the town council or with the finance committee that we wanna have some more detailed ideas about how things like dispatch and the nature of calls and the qualifications for the community responders we want and something about shifts and you know there are a whole bunch of things that I think would be very useful for us to try to uh, work out not that it'll all be decisions but at least a, a more detailed sense of what this might look like uh, to go forward with it. Uh, <clears throat> so if I mean, I, I'm happy for anybody to talk to him, but if people have specific questions, um, I would be happy to help relay them and try to get answers from him. I also wanted to say that uh, the town manager mentioned to me that it might be possible for some of us to visit the dispatch um, <clears throat> facility in Amherst uh, and just watch and get a sense of how dispatch works. Uh, so I have called the police chief and left a message saying I'd like to do that next week. And if anybody would like to go with me, uh, I would, you know, like to know that and we'll help set up the, the schedule to accommodate all this. I mean, I'm, it may have to be during the hours the chief works or something. I don't, I don't know exactly what will be required, but uh, I, wanted, I thought it'd be great if a few of us could go and just get a look at that and we'd, we'd know more and be able to have we'd have better questions and you know, better answers too. And then the last thing I wanted to mention is I wanted to suggest that we write to the finance committee and the town council in general 
um, sort of right away and invite them to send us questions in advance. Because if they can, if they're able to tell us what they'd like to know, where they want more detail than is in our report, if we knew those questions ahead of time, we might be able to come up with either answers or possibilities at least. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Ms. Ferreira? Um, I guess I have some questions. It's more so based on what Mr. Vernon Jones said and everything. So I don't know if that's something that we could um, discuss at some point or because I guess in terms of what you brought up, one, I'd like to hear more because this is the second time that I'm hearing about um, the town manager kind of meeting with the the fire chief and the police and town. So I want to know more about what's going on with that. What are those meetings about and things like that? So I'd like to get more details on that. Mm -hmm. Two, in terms of this person, Erwin Amos, it seems like he seems like he has a lot of good information. So I'm wondering what would be the best way to do it, Mr. Vern Jones? Is it us giving you questions or should we have him come and meet with us, you know, at one of our meetings? Um, mm -hmm. Since he's he's nationally known and, and works with different people, maybe if we have, you know, some time with him, then we could kind of really hone in on some of the things that we would need to have. Um, and then in terms of the questions for for the town council and the finance committee, I think that's good, but is that separate than what already the presentation committee already put together or is it, we're asking them, okay, what is it that you wanna know so that then we can frame the presentation? I guess I'm a little bit confused about that. Yes, Mr. Vernon Jones. Um, all good questions. Uh... <laughs> I, I don't know anything about you know what the internal discussions are among among town staff, um, so that would be a town manager question. I think it'd be great to have Amos Irwin come meet with us sometime, but I think we also need to get some of this put together in the next week to ten days. Uh, so I'm not sure we have time for a meeting before that, but I think we should plan on having him come meet with us. Um, <clears throat> my intention was not to change the plan for the uh, presentation. But if we were able to know ahead of time some of the questions they were gonna ask us after our presentation, we could be better prepared with answers. That was, that was my thought about it. Thank you, Mr. Vernon Jones. Uh, Ms. Pat? So a couple of things. Um, Mr. Ross, thank you for uh, issues that you raised. I am wondering if it's possible for Mr. Emmers to provide us with um, maybe information that he has, um, because we're talking about program development of CRES, uh, of CRES and also probably job descriptions, you know, for us to read ahead of time before the uh, finance committee and the uh, town council presentation so that we have an idea of um, what he knows in other places that he's helping. That might help us instead of going back and forth uh, with questions is one thing. I think in terms of observing the dispatcher, I mean, do we need to have more than one person? I mean, if people want to volunteer that. I think also, um, Also observing, I feel like the um, nonprofit organizations that work with uh, people with mental illness, it would be nice for us to observe how they deal with you know, crisis calls too. And I'm, you know, I'm talking about ServiceNet and uh, CDH also, something for us to think about. Perhaps when we invite them, maybe it's something we might wanna ask them um, I know there's a lot of confidentiality that, you know, that has to be maintained. So I just want to throw that out. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Moisen and then Ms. Ferreira. Um, I guess the question that I have is, and, and I, I retract in terms of like meeting with Amos, because I think 
well, I guess the question I have for Mr. Vernon Jones, or what have you, because we're, we're, we're having this, this sense that we need more details, right, to present to the town council and present, like you said, I mean, that wasn't what was communi communicated to us originally, but now it's, it, it's changed. So my thing is, I guess, do we have a sense or maybe our, our, one of our co-chairs can, can kind of reach out to the town council to see how much detail are they working are they asking for? I mean, do we need to like create the whole program for them too? Is that what we're going at? I guess I'm just kind of a little bit like, okay, how much detail is this, right? Do we need to iron out everything? You know, create job descriptions. I mean, what 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 is the, what is the deal with that? Um, because if so, yeah, I guess we are in a time crunch, and, and and I guess we need to know by when we need to create all this detail too. There's a lot of question marks to me. Um, with this. So, because it, there's also all, only so much that we can do in terms of doing all the work for the town, right? Um, but do any of you have any of the, the answers to these questions? Because it seems like there's this urgency about putting details and having details done by a certain time certain. How much details and by when? Um, Mrs. Pat? So well, Ms. Marston has her hand up first. Ms. Moyston. Um, I just wanted to check with Mr. Vernon Jones and how he's spelling Amos's last name to start with. I I R W I N. Amos Irwin. Irwin. Okay, thank you. And then um I can't really speak on how much detail that the council is looking at but and, well let me back up to the first thing about the, the the town manager meeting with the different groups of individuals or people I know that he's trying to form to pull together a group of people to help make these recommendations that you have happen to put those in in motion right so it will take members from the CSWG and members from this leadership team to work together to put these forward and I would think for detail, it just depends on on what it is. I think that um, things like whether they work with the police or don't work with the police or the police go with them to some degree, I think that's the level of details because I don't think that he, they anticipate you guys doing everything and definitely not the job descriptions and those things. But I mean, that's the way it, it, it appears to sound up here in town hall is that that's what they're looking for, more of like how you want it. The, the shape of it, right? And and I don't know about further detail than the shape. And, and by when? Um, I, I haven't heard anything of a deadline. There's only been one leadership meeting and that was really just to kind of go over the CREST program, which I was like, well, there's all these in the CREST program. And then I said, but we really need to have all of the recommendations that the CSWG has given so that we can just put everything, try to implement everything moving forward, if that makes sense, right? Like, instead of just taking one piece and then one piece and then like two years later doing one piece, try to write out a blueprint for whatever amount of time frame that that is. And when you say the leadership team, who is that again? I've, I've heard some people, but who? Mm -hmm. It's who the two chiefs. Five? Okay. Sean Mangano, the finance committee, I mean, finance director, mm -hmm. Mary Beth Olgowicz, who is the senior center director, uh, David Zomek, the assistant town manager, Paul Bockelman, town manager, and myself. Okay. Thank you. That, that makes it a little bit more clear to me. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mrs. Pat? A couple of things. This is not rock rocket science, to be honest with you. What we're talking about here is um, a, a public safety department that will be run by social services professional. The program is going to entail a lot of crisis management. There are, uh, there are organizations in our community or even surrounding town that deals with crisis management, they, you know, we can tap into them. It's not too hard. You know, there are a lot of templates for job descriptions. There are some of us who have experience in program development. It's not a big deal. 
I mean, I have tons of experience developing programs. So, you know, working, you know, doing shifts, you know, uh, covering shift for 24 seven. But I can't speak about what police people do, but um, I don't want this to, you know, derail us. If we're not quite um, prepared for the detail, I recommend that we just let this uh, town council and the finance committee that we were not instructed to come up with details. And that's true. We were just told to give number, numbers. If I knew that we were going to be talking about this, I would have produced something like, you know, through a subcommittee and, you know, for us to look at. It's not hard. I mean, I mean, I mean, um, long term industry. So I've created so many programs. So I, we shouldn't spend too much time on this, is my point. Thank you, Mrs. Pat. Um, Ms. Bowman, I think you have your hand raised. Yes, I do. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted, wanted somebody to like put a little note somewhere. Oh, my hand is so raised. I wanted somebody to put a little note somewhere just, um, how should I say this? As, as you know, as, as I think about, you know, these social service type organizations, and if we're going to tap into the, some of these places, I really um, want there to be some sort of note put in about um, incorporating um, organizations like DCF. Um, you know, because then you run into all these like, oh, well, it's a mandated reporting situation, but like, we know for a fact that DCF comes into the BIPOC community, their families, and takes their kids. We know this for a fact. Um, a lot of times, rather than making sure they're getting the services that they need. And so I just want to put that out there that I really feel like that needs to be like a big highlighted side note because we're going to have, that's going to have to be part of what's being addressed in the bigger picture. Um, and I just don't feel like I've heard it be, it, heard it be said. Um, but if you're low income or you're BIPOC, DCF very, off, very often comes in and will remove children in situations where if you are not one of those things, children would not be removed. And so we need, like, if we're really doing this and we're trying to protect these communities and we really need to keep, we need to keep that real reality. Um, we need to keep that reality as part of like what our, like when we're talking about recommendations and so on and so forth and involving these already pre organized organizations, we need to be thinking about stuff like that. So just wanted to put that out there. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Um, Mrs. Moisten, I think you have your hand up. I do, and I was trying to type at the same time. Um, so I just, I want to say that, and, and perhaps some of that level of, def of detail is like, are you suggesting that like in, and I can't quite remember what happened with the finalization of like domestic violence cases, whether or not police go with a worker or don't go with the worker or, or go with DSF or DCF, sorry, or don't go with DCF. I think perhaps some of those things that you guys might um, be able to clarify would be helpful. And I also just want to say that BHN has recently, I believe it was BHN, recently contracted with the city of Springfield or Holyoke or one of the two to do a very similar program. So, I mean, that might be someone that you guys would like to speak with in regards to how that works, what makes them, because they're working with the police, I believe, but what made them decide to do that, why, or as opposed to not working with the police or, you know, Springfield and Holyoke have a little bit of a different um, um, level of violence than what the town of Amherst has, but it, you know, I think it would be worth checking in with as long, uh, along with CHD, ServiceNet, BHN, which is Behavioral Health Net. I just think all of those agencies, um, you guys should most, if possibly can get it done for next week, speak with them before speaking with the council and finance committee. 
Thank you, Ms. Moyston. Ms. Bowman? I agree. Um, you know, that's that, yeah, that falls into part of like, I think that's actually a great idea to like be talking to them ahead of time because that is part of my concern is that um, what's supposed to happen because I've been, I've had to deal with it before, not personally, but um, what's supposed to happen is that if, if a mom or partners get, have a domestic altercation, then if there are kids involved, if there are kids in the home, whether or not they're there, if there are kids in the home, they are supposed to call DCF, period. Like that's what, that is what. Like I looked it up and then I also happened to know somebody who works for DCF and I actually asked her like what is supposed to be the, the relationship, the policy. And anytime the police show up, to a domestic violence situation, whether or not the kids are there, DCF is supposed to come out and do an assessment um, because their view is that um, even if the, the kids aren't witnessing the violence directly, that they're witnessing the trauma because the mom is gonna go, or you know, or the father, sorry, I just, you know, the people I've known have been women are going to go through trauma Regardless, either in the either because there's visible bruises or because of emotional the emotional aspect of it, um, there that's why they're supposed to come in. So technically, like that's why I was concerned because I was like, yeah, like I actually talked to them, and they that is what they're that's what the police are supposed to be doing, and a lot of times they don't do it, but um, a lot of these other organizations will do it. Like, I feel like they really will do it. You know what I'm saying? And and that's that's where I get, that's where my, part of my concern comes in because they, you know, they're like, we're mandated reporters, we have to report. But like, technically everybody who walks this earth is a mandated reporter. Like, if you see something done to, you know, violence happen, especially to a child, you're supposed to report it. So. Anyways, yep. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Um, so I just wanted to make a couple of comments. Um, one in regards to Mr. Vernon Jones' comment earlier um, and Mrs. Pat's response. I don't think it's necessary we have more than one person go, but I would also be happy to go with you uh, just because that's something I would also personally like to observe. So if you would like to contact me, I would be happy to plan that with you. Um, and then also regarding the questions for the town council, if everybody else is also in agreement, I think it is a good idea to reach out to both the finance committee and the town council ahead of time, just in preparation to see what their questions might be so that we can make sure we're addressing all of them and that things aren't left out. Um, but also we have already received an email from the town manager with questions that were given to him from the town council um, in regards to our work and in regards to the presentation which he gave um, about our work to the town council. Um, and we have not yet sent a full response to those questions. Um, so if that's something that we can forward to the whole group, it might actually be helpful for you guys to know what questions there are they already have for us. Um, and I would also be happy to reach out to the town council for you all, if that's something we are interested in doing to move forward. Oh. Oh. Mrs. Pat? So when, when did it send out these questions again? I'm confused. Um, so the town manager sent them to Brianna and I after the presentation from the town council the, pre the presentation that he gave to the town council, the town council compiled some questions for him and he sent them to us. Uh, we didn't necessarily have the answer to all of the questions, which is why we haven't written back. Um, and there are some other um, anonymity issues, which we have not figured out how to respond to yet. But I think just in, just for you all to see what kinds of questions they're already having to anticipate this. I think it would be helpful if everybody could be aware of the questions that were asked, whether or not we have answers yet. Is, it, is that questions we can address to me? I'm sorry. 
are these questions, you know, is that something we can discuss later after the reparation group present? Um, I, I, I think so. Um, it's not on the agenda, but I think after reparations presents, if we want to come back to it and if we have time, I think that that would be something I'd be open to discussing with the group, if everybody is okay with that. Well, well I, I think like I'd, I'd rather like us kind of get into the presentations and then we can discuss the questions at the same time because of it, but I, I want to see what, what we have so far for presentation because, you know, time is passing. Okay, great. Um, so if everyone is okay, I think we can move on now to the next section um, for on the agenda, which is reparations for Amherst. Um, and I believe they are here in the audience. Ms. Moyston, if you can please bring them in. Hi, is Michael with you as well? Matthew, I'm so sorry. See Matthew. Hi, Mrs. Miller. I think you're still <laughs> muted. <laughs> oh, you are. <laughs> so I know Matthew is here. I just I I don't see him. We're in a you know in a separate space. So, um, but I I know that he was here. Let me just make sure. Or if you could ask him what his name is. I see an Oroville International. Is that him? <laughs> okay, I'm always scared when they're from out of the area because often they are. Yeah. Yeah. Zoom bomber. So. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Hi. Um, hello, Michelle. Nice Thank you for coming today. Thank oh. you for inviting us. Happy to be here. And then I think we have. Sorry, everybody. I am um, too many Zoom accounts. <laughs> and uh, my camera just takes a minute, but I'll be here in a sec. Hi. Awesome. We can see you now. Thank you so much for being here today. Um, so I had originally reached out to reparations for Amherst. We didn't really have a specific ask for them, uh, just that we recognize that their goals deeply align with our charge um, and that we are working towards a similar goal of making Amherst more equitable and safe for the BIPOC community. Um, and so I, I asked them to come today and just share any information or ideas that they would like to with us. And then I will open the floor uh, for questions. Um, so I would like to hand this over to Reparations for Amherst. Thank you. And thanks for inviting us to be here. Um, and just before we get into anything, I really just want to um, send so much appreciation and gratitude to all of you. Uh, you know, I know that not a lot of people get to come to these meetings, but Matthew and I have been following these meetings and the work that you are all doing is so deep and um, it's just really, really meaningful and significant and um, we very much appreciate it. And on a personal note, I know um, I feel like what I supplied as a resident of Amherst to you all, um, I feel it was heard and I just really want to acknowledge and appreciate that. Um, so we don't have a presentation per se, uh, however, we wanted to come and first of all, just let you know that we are completely in solidarity with you. We completely support your work. Um, and there are a lot of, um, as Alicia said, a lot of um, intersecting places where our work aligns. And so, um, Mostly we wanted to talk about how we can strengthen our coalition. Um, so, so we can strengthen the work that you're doing and the work that we're doing um, and support each other as we move forward in this, in our unique processes that we're, um, that we're going through. So um, that's kind of like the, just a little, a little bit of, of what we wanted to say and then we're happy to extrapolate and answer questions and things like that. Maybe Matthew wants to add something as well. I mean, I, I'll also just echo what Michelle said that we're really appreciative for all the work that you all are doing. Um, and I think in just narrowing it a little bit, um, 
we imagine, we know that you all are um, working towards developing structures within the town to support the community safety of the whole town uh, and to support a transformation of what has been to what could be as far as community safety for this town. And of course, those structures require um, funds, they require support, you know, financial uh, inputs, um, and also reparations, obviously, you know, on a material level requires a commitment from the town if there's going to be municipal reparations. And we just really, it's been important to us all along and continues to be important to us that we are um, thinking about that collectively and not, you know, different groups trying to access the same sources of funding that we think collectively as a town, like what is this, what are the needs at this time? Um, we happen to believe that until this town or any town or any, any group or any, or the country actually goes through a process of reparations and healing for um, the crimes that have been committed collectively uh, and, and you know, as far as what we're, the work that we're doing specifically against black people, that any work, any racial equity work, any um, work to try to um, create collective systems that are fair, it's gonna be hampered by the lack of healing, the lack of repair. It's like reparations isn't something extra that we're gonna do, it's something that we're not doing. <laughs> the fact that we're not, we haven't gone through a process of repair is the state. Um, so, you know, we feel that, that there's like so many places of intersecting um, vision and possibility and we wanna work together on that. And we're happy to answer any questions. I mean, we don't have a presentation prepared, but either of us is <laughs> perfectly capable of talking for longer than you want us to. So <laughs> if you have any questions, we're happy to answer them. Thank you, Ms. Ferreira. Thank you both for um, attending this meeting. Um, and obviously for all the work that you all are doing and the group is doing. Um, I've actually been getting uh, emails because I'm on the listserv, I think, for the reparations group too. Um, but unfortunately, I haven't been able to, you know, attend anything or, you know, really focus as much on those emails because of the work that I'm doing with the CSWG, right? And I'm trying to focus on that. Um, so that being said, you know, I do think that, of course, uh, the work that we're doing really aligns, right? And, and a lot of the priorities that we have are are really, you know, um, similar in terms of making sure that our community is a community that's for all, but also, you know, with a particular emphasis on BIPOC and particular emphasis on, you know, on Black people um, that have been, you know, obviously, as we know, marginalized and set to the side for, for years. Um, so I guess my question is, how is it that, you know, like for someone like myself in this group, right, that we're so focused on doing, you know, what would be the most beneficial, right, in terms of our input during this time, so that we are, as you're saying, you know, that we can work collectively, as opposed to working in isolation, being that we have a lot of common goals, right, that would be one. And then two, I guess I'd like to hear from the two of you, what is the, the focus right now? Where are you all at in your work, right? Where are you all at and what is the goal? Like, what are your goals that you're trying to attain as of right now um, so that I have a clearer picture? Yeah, I'll start with your second question. Um, both great questions. And um, as far as where we're at, we are set to present um, to the full town council on this coming Monday, the 17th. Um, we'll be presenting alongside two members of the black stakeholders group that we've been working with. 
So uh, we have about 10 minutes <laughs> to um, make a, a case. And what we're hoping the outcome will be is that a reparations committee will be created. So a municipal reparations committee will be created. Um, and to sort of move into your, set, your first question, um, I think we are both talking about the town once and for all prioritizing racial equity and justice and doing that um, through the budget. Um, and so I think that's where, uh, you know, we're, we're, both, we're both trying to make the case to the town that shifting money um, or including money um, for racial equity and justice matters is, um, is the way forward. And so if we can, I think we're already aligned enough um, that we are going to be, um, you know, in solidarity around that particular uh, ask. <laughs> so uh, on Monday, when we present, we'll be um, specifically asking for a committee to be set up. And I, I think Matthew and I both would envision that our committees can sort of work together in some ways, or maybe have like a liaison um, if possible that is communicating back and forth between committees. Um, and then we are going to propose that the town um, has a discussion around setting aside a significant and meaningful amount of money to address racial equity and justice. And so, of course, that includes the work that you're all doing, includes reparations. Um, and just to be a little more specific, we're going to talk about the cannabis money and um, the sort of reasoning for using cannabis money um, to uh, toward racial justice and equity, the connection there. And Matthew, if you wanted to add to that. I mean, I just, um, your question, Ms. Ferrer, was uh, fairly general. And I just am wondering if more backstory uh, would be useful um, about you know, the types of things that we've been up to so far. Um, yeah, that would be useful if you, you know, obviously you don't have to go into too much detail on that, but any kind of highlights that you think would be important in terms of background story, that would be. Yeah, I mean, I'll just say, um, keeping it short isn't my best, uh, <laughs> not what I'm best at, but, um, you know, we started, with a petition, Michelle and I. We started circulating a petition last June or July that specifically was modeled after what was happening in Evanston. And the petition said, we want an apology and an acknowledgement from the town for participation and involvement in anti-Black racism. And we want a reparations fund, municipal reparations fund. And so we circulated that as kind of just like, does anybody care about this? You know, what's What's going to happen? And we got a lot of feedback, a lot of signatures and a lot of positive feedback in the comments. And we thought, OK, so there's something here. So we worked uh, with three town councilors on a resolution um, that was the first stage of that. That was the apology and the acknowledgement. And that was uh, passed unanimously on December 7th. And then we shifted into research. Well, we, there was part, some research that came before that. Um, we put together a historical document that's about 10 pages and all this stuff's on the town website. Um, the historical document was obviously at 10 pages, not everything, um, it, you know, it was just an overview, but it, the purpose was to educate people who had no idea um, about the town's history. And so, after that, we shifted to kind of looking into research about why, um, you know, looking, we, we had specific data about inequity in the town. And so we wanted to understand why. And so that's the report that was sent to you all last week was the result of that research process and the symposium that we held, I guess, two weeks ago, a week or two ago, um, was a, a presentation of all that research in various areas. Um, and so all of that, you know, uh, 
I'm, you, you're probably familiar with HR 40, the um, House Resolution 40, where the, there's a <clears throat> effort to create a committee that would do research, discovery, and then make recommendations about reparations. And so we've been doing that research and trying to understand how did Amherst get to be what it is right now? It's easy for Amherst to kind of slip off of the racial justice radar because of the demographics, but um, Amherst was created, cultivated as a white enclave. Um, and so we were really trying to understand that process. Um, and in order to make the case, in order to help people understand, you know, it's like even make the case is like an argument, help people understand that uh, there's a need for repair on a municipal level in this town. We're also, um, in our intention is to also do a more collective, uh, you know, call it a fundraising campaign or an invitation to the public to contribute to a reparations fund. We don't right now have a fiscal sponsor. Um, it's important to us the makeup of the board of directors of the fiscal sponsor and we've met with some different groups and have looked into some different options and are continuing to do so. Um, so we can't accept donations or contributions until we have either our own 501c3 status or a fiscal sponsor. Um, and we also intend to work with the um, anchor institutions in the town, the University of Massachusetts and Amherst College. And we've had um, some initial meetings uh, with those institutions and look to continue working with them in the future. So there's kind of three parts to it. There's municipal reparations, there's community, you know, just broad-based individual community, there's the anchor institutions, and also, you know, there's financial reparations, material reparations, creating a fund. And then there's, you know, what does healing look like for something so long-term with such staggering, you know, detrimental impacts, intergenerational trauma, like what is, what is a collective process of community healing look like? So that's another question that we're sitting with. Um, yeah, so there was something else I was gonna say, but I lost it. Michelle, is there anything you wanna to add to that? Or? Uh, no, just, you know, we, um, we recognize that um, this sort of budget cycle is upon us now and um, that we have an opportunity, you know, one of the challenging things I think about our setup here is that we have a town manager who um, is excellent at sort of doing the, um, the things that the town manager does, but the town manager isn't necessarily a, like a policy leader. And so it's the town council that acts as the policy leader. And so our, uh, our, our goal is to help the town council as the policy leader understand the significance of these matters. Um, because, uh, you know, town manager Bachelman, um is, you know, one part of the puzzle, but really the policy leadership and um, the, pri the priorities um, are gonna come specifically from the town council. And so that's been a big part of our work is like through the educational process and through the conversations that we've been having is to help the town council as the leadership body um, recognize the priority around this and um, and then hopefully lead to a process where um, the budget will be prioritized in uh, sort of at that level. Thank you so much. Mrs. Pack. So where can I begin? I just feel like I've known Michelle and Matthew for a long, long time with the reparation project that they're doing. I have nothing but appreciation, gratitude for being a white co-conspirator um, doing this. I know it has not been easy for you guys um, to stand up to do this. I'm, I'm just like super grateful. 
So um, when I first got the email back uh, a while ago, I was like, wow, this is so cool. White people doing this for us. Isn't that awesome? When I applied to join CSWG, right from the moment, from the first day that we had our first meeting, I couldn't help connecting the work we're doing to reparation. Anything that we're doing at CSWG, I've always viewed it from the from reparation lens and my network. The people I, I contact that contact me, for example, the BIPOC Cultural Center is something that I've heard so much from Black community and even BIPOC community. So I see a lot of uh, intersection with the work that um, Reparation Group is doing and the work we're doing, and we shouldn't, be sh we shouldn't shy away from it. Reparation should not be such a scary word to use. Um, I think it's something we need to embrace because it's overdue and there's nothing wrong with you know, pushing for it. And I know, you know we've had some white folks over the years who have done something that we don't necessarily recognize as reparation. One of them is in our means. Uh, is with us here, Ross, uh, my children were direct beneficiary at Fort River School when he created Affinity uh, Group. Do you remember that, Ross? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It had lasting impact on my children. It made them what they are today. The confidence you give to black children. And I know that that um, white parents, some white parents are part of a school. We're opposed, you know, we're opposed to it. You had a lot of enemies from your white folks. But preparation is not new here, but different people do it in a different way. And so this is finally being put out in the open. I'm very excited about it. We shouldn't shy away from it. I think we need to embrace it, is my point. So thank you, two of you, for coming out tonight uh, to talk to us. I, I push for this because I think it's important for the uh, town officials and town employees uh, to know that CSWG, the work we are doing, whether you call it CRES or youth program, or uh, Bipolar Cultural Center, um, they are all about reparation. Let's embrace that word. Thank you. Yes, go ahead, Matthew. <laughs> I don't know, it seems like that's the protocol. Um, I just, you know, Ms. Pat, um, you touched on one specific thing that is a very concrete connecting point, which is the Multicultural Community Center. And one, the thing I remembered that I was going to say before, and I think Michelle alluded to this, but we have, we're working with a um, Black Stakeholders Committee. And it's been clear from the petition, from the very beginning, this isn't about us collecting money and deciding where the money is going to go. The allocation of any reparations funds needs to be made and determined by, uh, uh, you know, we can say the black community, even though that's a, it's a you know, it's, there's not a one black community in Amherst, but a committee of black stakeholders. And one of the things that we've also heard is, you know, that people uh, want a community center and it could be that that's one of the things that the black stakeholders committee would decide to allocate funding for. And I know that that's on the, you know, something that you all have heard and it's part of your agenda. And, you know, we aren't determining, Michelle and I aren't determining the agenda for reparations, but it could very well. I mean, it seems like it's the kind of thing that would be right in the middle there. So I just wanted to acknowledge that. Ms. Pat? So I just want to bring up something and for me, it doesn't bother me, but I know that in black community, um, the issue of using cannabis um, marijuana funding for reparation, some people have concern about it, that it might encourage more um, 
places to be open for marijuana sales. To me, I mean, most of our people are the people who were put out to prison for a long time. I think that money should be used, but, um, but not everybody in Black community agrees with that. I just want to put that out right now. So you know what, I'm, what I mean, Deborah, right? <laughs> Yeah. Thank you, Mrs. Pat. If anybody else has anything to say about that, I mean, it doesn't have to be right now, but um, we would love to, like feedback is always good. Um, Mrs. Owen, I think you had your hand up also. Yeah, I just wanted to thank you, Michelle and Matthew, for the work that you all do. Um, I did get a chance to start watching parts of the symposium and the research that you guys did was really important and really shocking to me. And it seems like what's happened in Amherst in the time that I've been here is just a repeat of what has happened before. So given you guys are experts on this being a pattern, I'm interested to hear what your advice for our group is to make sure our charge and our report and our presentation is as effective as possible to make sure that this, the pattern stops. Yeah, that's a really great question. And thank you for acknowledging um, the work, the research work that we've done. Um, you know, I think that the town council, and I, I don't know um, if you, I wasn't clear just from listening in the beginning, I'd love to clarify. So is it, it's my understanding that you're creating a report that will be submitted to the town council somewhere in the next seven to 10 days prior to your presentation. Is that, is that, okay. Um, yeah, I think that um, based on my experience with the town council so far, I think as much information, you, you, you have all from the beginning of this process collected enormous amount of information um, and then worked with 7Gen and got a really thorough report from them. So you've sort of, you have a lot of information. Um, and I think that the town council really needs um, to see all of those various angles, you know, like the 7Gen report, all of the data that you've collected prior to that happening through your community forums. Um, in my experience, um, having a really thorough and detailed report, um, and not necessarily the detail. I know, Ms. Pat, you were you. There was some talk earlier about like, you know, exact details of how. I think it's more at this stage about like making the case of why the money should be directed toward this program and the other recommendations that you have made. Um, and the significance for our community. And so um, I would just say uh, that in our experience, the, the report that we, the reports that we have created, I think have been helpful for the town council in getting a better picture of the, like, I think some, sometimes we assume that people know things because we're in this, you know what I mean, all the time and we're reading and taking in information and talking to other people. And of course the lived experience of BIPOC, like it's, it's surprising to me how little people actually do know, you know? And so anything that you can highlight in there is just, um, you know, I guess, in my experience, I, I now figure, you know, there's nothing I'm going to assume somebody knows about racial justice and equity. It's like, assume they know nothing <laughs> and give them all of the possible information that you can. And, um, and that would be my kind of encouragement um, around, did that, did that answer the question? And maybe Matthew wants to also add to that. Yeah, I think that answered the question really well, but I'm also open to hear from Matthew too. A different way of saying it would be that I understand, I mean, I don't, you know, I can imagine how frustrating and re-traumatizing it would be to have to explain to people 
who are complicit in a system of white supremacy, why these things need to happen. And at the same time, Michelle and I have, like she said, been conscious of just, you know, being as clear as possible and not assuming anything, not assuming that anybody knows anything. And, you know, there's people who are mean and, you know, intentionally divisive, but I think they're in the minority. And I think a lot of white people just really have no idea. And when we put out that just, you know, 10 pages of bullet points, I think a lot of people were really surprised. Um, and we got criticism from a few people, uh, a few black folks who were like, why are you putting this out there? It's so obvious, everybody knows this. But <laughs> unfortunately, the reality is that people really don't know. And um, so that's also, you know, part of the symposium was about community education for that reason. And I think Mattia did such an amazing job of saying like, I grew up in this community. I went to these schools in this community where I had to learn about community history and none of it was there. And so, you know, people, it's really easy as a white person to be removed from the lived experience, to be separate and to not know his, like the facts is one thing. And that leads to not really understanding um, the implications today. So it's like, I guess that, you know, I, it's, a, it's not such a straightforward thing. And um, we have been intentional about not assuming that anybody knows anything. Mrs. Ferreira. Great. So I just had like one quick follow up, um, which was like from when Miss Miss Pat uh, was talking and she said that, you know, we had made certain recommendations uh, in our, you know, when we made our recommendations that I think align with some of some of the uh, possible recommendations you all would make. And I guess for me, that's what I would be more interested in. And I think that was what my other question was about, was just kind of more concretely, right? And, and this could be something that y'all could think about and then get in touch with us, right? Some of the recommendations we made are those online because then obviously if we are given certain budget items to that, it's not something that then you all need to ask for again type of thing. Or how can we do it so that we can get the full funding for what we asked for? You see what I'm saying? So I think that that would be that would be something we'd need to really think about and strategize on. Um, and then also, you know, when you all had talked about, you know, CSWG and then if, when you all have your commu committee for us to have a liaison on both, I think that would be very good so that we can share that information and that we're not redoing and, and hammering on the same information that we always kind of talk through. Because at the end of the day, we always know that especially for, for situations like this, and that's why we need to make them a priority. But unfortunately for, for, for what we're asking for, a lot of times this always comes out to be limited budget. <laughs> I don't know why, but of course for our, the things that, you know, that we're fighting for, it always seems to be limited. So how can we use the, the funding you know, the most wisely possible? And lastly, I think this is something that has always bothered me. And I think you all have heard me talk about it in, in the past in other forums. In terms of healing, right, when that healing portion that you all talk about as part of reparation, which is very, it's, it's, that's pivotal, that's critical, right, uh, in terms of doing this type of work, um, given, you know, atrocities that have happened in the past. But for me, I, and I, I wonder, have you all thought about this? I, I guess we can't start a healing conversation until we even talk about the name Amherst, you know what I'm saying, and the fact that our town is named Amherst. I mean, we've, we've, we've changed the, our, our holiday to Indigenous Peoples Day, you know, because of another, um, you know, a, a person who represented, you know, killing and murder. Um, so, you know, so I'm still kind of baffled about that, that our town is still called Amherst after someone that obviously um, killed a ton of people. But that's, I don't know if you all have any response to anything that I've said. Yeah, you, there was a bunch of stuff there, but just starting at the end and working backwards, we specifically decided to focus on reparations for anti-Black racism. 
And that is by no means an, uh, implies that there doesn't need to be reparations for indigenous people. And that there, you know, that there aren't other groups that need a process of repair or that are, uh, need, isn't really the right word, that deserve a process of repair. But that's just what we're focusing on. Um, and so we've, this is a, in a, a way, another kind of way of answering uh, Ms. Owen's question. We have been very targeted and specific. So we're just trying to like, what's the next thing that relates as closely as possible to what we're trying to do and to not get distracted by either, um, you know, very important, valuable efforts that are really closely related or by um, things that, you know, could, might need to happen down the line, but don't need to happen next. Um, there's, there's a park in the town that is named after a person who was involved in expelling. And this is, I don't, uh, I, you know, unfortunately don't know the details of this, but somebody was telling me about um, Kendrick Park and the reason that that park exists, um, that people were moved out of town and, and the park was created to justify moving people out of town. And so, you know, that's definitely, you know, renaming that park, renaming and, and renaming the town um, are important steps, but it's, you know, we just haven't gotten there yet. We haven't gotten to that, you know, and, and again, those are the sorts of things that aren't gonna come from us. I, I'm not gonna rename the town. And it, it's also interesting, I was thinking with what Ms. Pat said about the community center, if I decided to give a community center, a multicultural community center to the population, to the residents of Amherst, that would not be reparations. So the fact that the community center exists is not reparations. You know, what makes it reparations is that it's a decision, an empowered decision by the harmed party, you know, who, who has the resources and the capacity and the ownership of the process and says, this is what we want to do. So, you know, in a way that's our role. That's how we see our role is facilitating that rather than being involved in the, you know, decision-making process and the nitty gritty of it. Mrs. Pack? My two, my two, I'm glad you raised that. That's how I feel about CSWG. What is exciting about our group is that all of us, except for Ross, where, you know, um, we're talking from lived experiences and we're recommending programs that we think will benefit our people. And so to me, that's, you know, part of reparation. So when we call it BIPOC Cultural Center, it's just, I'm not able to explain it very well. So that's my thinking like, who is recommending what? And from what perspective? Is it lived experience or is it the dominant uh, culture telling us this is good for you? You know, take it or leave it. So that's very, very um, important for us to note. As I was listening to everyone, it occurred to me that Dr. Barbara Love actually came to our group and she mentioned, recommended actually, or suggested um, that the whole town engage in visioning process. And as she was talking to us that, that evening, I couldn't help thinking perhaps maybe I can see that relating to healing process as well. And I don't know what the town manager has in mind or the town council. I don't know if they're going to like dissolve CSWG. One of the things that I would like to see is to have um, reparation group uh, advocating for CSWG to continue for CSWG also to, to see the work we're doing as a reparation. It's not 
you know, we can't just be doing this work and at the end of June, you're done. Thank you. Goodbye. Then all our effort for the past several months goes to a waste because there is no accountability. You know, there is no continuity. I would really like um, the town council to have CSWG as a standing committee until foreseeable future. Uh, but I have concerns because I'm already hearing through grapevine that some of the town councilors wants to get rid of, rid of this group because they don't like the fact that we're very unafraid, that we're speaking true to the power. And that's why elections have consequences. So to me, reparation also means we need to change the structure of who holds decision-making in this town through election, that we need more, we need BIPOC candidates to run in November as well. That's when I'm, you know, that will really, really be reform or change in this town. And also maybe some white co-conspirators who really get it for us um, because what we currently have now it's not going to make it for us. I'll shut up. That's what I want to say. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Mrs. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Ms. Miller. You can uh, respond. I uh, I just will second um, the idea of having a standing, um, you know, public safety committee. I think that that would really be beneficial um, to carry the work that you all have done and sustain it and have it be a part of the structure of the town. So, thank you, <laughs> Michelle. We'll see how that goes. <laughs> thank you, Mrs. Bowman. So I fully agree with Ms. Pat. Um, you know, I, and I think I've said it in different ways going throughout, going as we've been going on, is that I have very little confidence in um, the non BIPOC community of Amherst. Little confidence. Um, I know we, there are um, a few co conspirators out there, but. This community doesn't represent, this government, our government doesn't represent what the community is, what the community looks like. And when something like that um, occurs in that, in that way, then there's going to be disparities, you know. Um, and it's hard not to sit back and be like, um, and, and recognize that people who are in power and who are making decisions, who have always been allowed to make decisions in one form or another, are going to have a hard time giving up that space, even if it's for the better of the community. And we really need to recognize that. And We were speaking a little bit in, the, in one of our last meetings just about how um, we need to find ways to attract the BIPOC community to town government. Um, because if we don't get it, if we don't change what our government, our town government looks like, um, we're not gonna see change in what's going on. Um, because you have a group of people who are very comfortable in what's going on right now who are running, what's going, what, so like, so like, if I'm sitting here and being pampered and being like given gifts and this, that, and the other, and someone else is like, oh, well, give me a chance to have some of that. I ain't gonna lie. I'm gonna be like, um, I like where I am right now. I like what's happening right now. It fits my needs right now. Why would I change that? Um, you can figure out a way to do your own thing, but why would I? Why would I change what I'm doing? Um, <clears throat> so, I think it's really important um, for us um, as we go through and do this work. Part of what we need to be doing on the side is 
uh, either bringing someone along with us to want to like encouraging people by pop community to show up to these meetings, see what these meetings are about, um, encourage by pop people, have them understand like there were a number of meetings that I barely said anything, but then when I started talking, I can't stop. Um, so I think that's really important because it's like I don't like being in the spotlight. Um, Anybody who really knows me personally knows that I'm a pretty big introvert, but um, I really am passionate about, passionate about things like in just when things are being, things are happening that are in just, I get very passionate about it. And then I, you know, and then I, my voice just, I just let my voice out. And one of the things that I was saying in the in the one of the meetings before is that it took me a few meetings to kind of get a feel. And so we need to encourage the BIPOC community to be able to come to these meetings, encourage them, have a couple people over and run, you know, you know, have a meeting and run them, you know, run these meetings with a few of your your BIPOC community members and be like, look, I just want you to sit in on this meeting. I want you to have an opportunity to say something if you'd like to say something, whatever the case may be, but we have to we have to get we have to help them understand not only how how important it is for the you know the town committee, the school committee, the housing committee to look like our group, to be mixed like our group, but also you know, and I mean, our group is still not even all that mixed. Like we, we know that it's not all that mixed. We know there are other people in the community that, you know, would benefit from being part of this group. But, you know, but also it's like part of it is fear. Part of it is time. We were talking, I was talking uh, before and, you know, and saying to um, Jen that the, the Zoom format is really helpful for me as a single mom. Cause then it allows me to still have my kids running around like cycles around my house, but then I can still mute things and still be participating, um, still can, you know, make dinner and still be participating. And so like, you know, those things are really important um, to diversify um, our town committee. So I do really, I just, I wanted to put that out there. I do really think I'm really like I'm really like more passionate about this, but I'm really there's still a part of me that's super concerned that we're we're gonna have a hard time convincing the BIPOC community to really step up and step forward. And I really want us to like you know really be pulling in our our friends, our families, whatever, um, and really think about that and trying to help people make the time. I'll watch your kids so you can do this meeting type thing. You know what I'm saying? Like we really need to like figure out ways to diversify this community because it needs it desperately. You know, this, this town government needs it. So I think that's something we should be thinking about too. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Bowman. Um, are there any other members of the Community Safety Working Group that have any questions for uh, reparations for Amherst? Okay. Um, I also just wanted to thank you guys so much for being here today. Um, I also was able to attend your symposium and it was actually life-changing for me. Um, and it brought a lot of knowledge and informed a lot the work that we were doing here. It helped me sort of redirection myself in a time of complete frustration. Um, and it kind of gave me a little bit of fuel to keep going because I see the huge necessity. I, I, if I didn't know it was a necessity before, the fact that this has been continuing to happen for decades just makes it even more pressing for me. Um, and so I really appreciate the work that you guys put into that um, and the knowledge that I gained from it. It was very essential and I will carry that through the rest of my work in this town probably forever. Um, so thank you guys so much for that. And thank you guys so much for being here today and for taking the time to speak with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah.
onward until the next time we get to meet. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Um, now that we have finished our conversation with reparations for Amherst, I want to remind you all of upcoming town council meeting on May 24th. I also want to check in with Brianna to see how much progress she has made on the graphics bar report and see if she needs anything from the group to expedite this process. Um, next, we should discuss as a group if there are any other groups organizations the CSWG would like to meet with before our charge ends. Um, and then also at this time, Brianna, sorry, I didn't know if you were available to just switch facilitation for a minute. My kids are in need of my attention for a second. Definitely, I can take over. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so I wanted to update you guys all. Um, I did, I'm almost done with the graphics for the final report, but one thing I wanted to ask of the group is if you all have any um, images or if any pictures from the Black Lives Matter protests that happened here, I wanna include as many pictures from Amherst that are, pers that are a little bit more personal. I was able to pull up some on Google, but um, I wasn't sure if anyone was involved in the protests that happened over the pandemic and whatnot. Ms. Moisten. I, I don't have them from the protest, but did you want the one for the redlining in Amherst? Oh yeah, that would be really helpful. Okay, I just, I gotta do a reminder there. Thank you. Brianna, I'll, I'll look because I know like um, we went to a couple of the, the, the youth ones that they had during the pandemic and, and some other ones. So I'll, I'll look through and I'll just send it to you. Awesome. I have about seven spaces where I could incorporate some graphics and um, I finished the cover page and everything is looking really, really good. So I'm excited for you all to see it. Um, I should be done after you all send me the graphics. So the sooner the better. So the next thing that I wanted to go over for this section, um, and I'm not sure if you guys discussed it before I got here, I do apologize for my tardiness, was groups that you all felt were necessary to meet with before we finish our charge. Ms. Pat? So actually, Dr. Shabazz made some suggestions for us, which um, Ms. Marston, I'm, you know, I assume you, you took notes. They are VHN, um, CDH, MS Connections, Great Great Door. Um, I believe someone mentioned the DCF. And I think we should also invite ServiceNet. We just have to be clear as to what is it that we want to hear from them because I'm keenly aware that they are all headed by white management. I do business with them on a regular basis. BHN, ServiceNet, nothing against them, but um, it is run and managed by white people. So, so we need to like flash out what is it that we want to hear from them. Yes. Uh, Ms. Ferreira. So yeah, Ms. Pat, I think that's what I would want to hear from a lot of you that have more contacts with them because okay. I don't have contacts with them to really see like how we can be strategic because obviously, you know, we have the part A, right, that we need to, to prepare for and present on, on the 24th. So I guess out of the, this group, which ones would be the ones that we would need to meet with to kind of meet that, that um, focal, you know, that goal that we have. And then which ones maybe, you know, unless you all think we need to meet with all of them. And then what we need to think about is obviously for part B, um, who else we might need to meet with to do that. But, but so that's that, that would be my question to those that kind of relay with these um, groups on a, uh, on a more frequent basis. I mean, it would be helpful, and I'm just expressing my opinion, it would be very, very helpful for us to hear at least from um, folks who work with homeless population, the Amherst Connection, Ms. Welling. I mean, she's one of those local heroes, heroes that, um, doesn't get recognized, but you know, that does really good work. I really very much like to hear from, from her. And I think, you know, great store. Um, it would be nice to have Kevin come in and talk to us. You know, with BHN ServiceNet, I'm more interested, I mean, if they want to come in to talk to us, but you know, how they deal with their crisis management. 
more than anything else, yeah. Um, and also uh, CDH, you know, they, they, op they operate hotline. So I'm very familiar with all these programs. I mean, that's, you know, that's my work every day. <laughs> um, I really would like to, to hear from uh, the League Women Voter. I don't, yeah. Because I see them as co-conspirators. They really, really support the work we're doing. And when we first met, I mean, they're one of the groups that really wanted to connect with us. I know they submitted something for us. I think I really like to, for us to consider inviting them um, to come talk to us. Um, I'm oh, Ms. Moyston and then uh, Mr. Vernon Jones. Um, I just, again, want to say in where the social workers come from doesn't really matter, but I, I do highly suggest that you guys speak with perhaps some social workers um, just to, un to understand the process because you are asking social workers to take over the work of the PD. And so I, you know, it seems that it would be very important to speak with them where they come from doesn't necessarily matter, but I think that is it's pretty important, it's particularly if somebody comes back and asks you, well, how does the social worker community feel about this, right? And then if you haven't talked to anybody, you don't have an answer to that. And I want everything that we're doing, and you know, granted I do get paid for this, but I'm truly invested and wanna see this succeed. And I just wanna make sure that we can eliminate as many holes as possible. And that, again, I just really think that you guys should speak with some social workers as well. Yeah. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones and then Ms. Pat, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. I certainly agree with what Ms. Moyston just said. Uh, I would suggest that we specifically add Family Outreach of Amherst. I know they're part of CHD, but they're, they're local. They've been here a long time and have had a lot of contact with a lot of folks. Um, and then I don't have an answer to this, but I guess I would suggest maybe we think about do we need to meet with all these groups or are there some we wanna meet with and others that we'd like to send a member or two to go talk to them uh, and solicit their answers? So, you know, our meeting time is so limited, um, but we could get more input uh, if we would sort of split them up and go talk to some of them if we, if we don't have time to meet with all of them. I, so I did, Ms. Pat, do you wanna go and then I'll respond to Mr. Vernon Jones? So oh, go ahead. I, I agree. And I think that would be the best way is if we split up the organizations and then reported back. Um, I do work with social workers. I work in um, child advocacy and I'm very familiar with social workers out of the Greenfield area office. I just want to warn the group ahead of time in what I've seen and what I've experienced. Um, DCF is a little bit political, so I'm not sure if they'd be able to comment on sort of open support for Crest, but I'm sure what they would be able to provide is more information on what a mandated, being a mandated reporter means and what it would mean for different situations that would arise that Crest responders would respond to, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. And I'd be happy to reach out to DCF. I do have um, a couple connections there. I was going to say we have some BIPOC social workers, but I'm not, I don't know if they do crisis management in their work. And I'm, th and I'm thinking about uh, Mrs. Wallace and also Heather Lloyd. I know they're social workers. Don't we have like a black um, psychiatrist that is, um, that work at UMass? Do we? A psychologist or some, somebody? What yeah. are name? Not necessarily coming to to talk to us here. Maybe you know somebody can reach out to them or something. I don't know. And and you know we run out, out of time. That I would have loved to hear from um, uh, staff of color in our school system. Um, like you know um, Mary Custard and yeah. So we run out of time. We didn't get any input from them. You know, what they see in terms of, you know, um, youth programming. 
Are there people on, oh, Ms. Moyston? I just have a clarity question, because um, I keep hearing you mentioning we're out of time and, and time is of the essence, but I just am curious, are you thinking that the terms expire in June? No. I'm, a, I'm saying uh, for our report. Oh, okay, okay. What you know about expiring? Are we going to continue this? I think that you should most definitely put that in as one of the top recommendations. We did. We did. Yeah. Yeah. No, it, it I thought you were I thought you were saying like thinking that June was the end of the term and it's well, not our final report. Our final yeah, report. Yeah. Okay. I would like to get more voices. You know what we're submitting now it has to do with money, but I would like our final report to also include other mm -hmm. voices too that we haven't heard from. Okay. I just wanted to to for clarity purpose. Okay. Ms. Rara. I guess, Ms. Moisten, I guess I'm confused about that. I, I did think that our term ended in June unless they extend it though. So did I miss something? It actually ends in September. What? Yeah. So I, I hold on one moment and I'll pull it up for you. Can you see? Not my desktop. Please tell me you don't see my desktop, but you see the charge in the our web page. Yeah, September one. Yep. Oh, yeah. okay. I did not know that. I thought it was. I thought it was the end of June. Yeah. No. So that's good. I think you guys should know when you, you know, the group dissolves. But I, yeah, I don't. I mean, it would be best for you guys to continue. Community safety work doesn't end when your charge ends, you know what I mean? So we need to make a decision tonight, like who are we inviting next week? Who is going to talk to who, you know, split ourselves up? Do we wanna invite all of the organizations or just have conversations and have people report back? Maybe you guys could build specific questions and then everybody asks those same questions questions perhaps I don't know if that works because some places might be different if you're not because we're also asking all of a sudden everybody just to come to this one meeting because that's it and if they don't have that availability you still want to be able to communicate with them so why don't we do that if they're not available can they write something up for us with our questions would be one option if they can't come I think that would work really well. Do we have the time to develop the questions really quickly right now? Or is that something you all would want um, a subcommittee to develop and approve by the group? Or I can develop the questions. I'm sure they'll be a little bit different for the different agencies. I can work with you. OK. That sounds good. <laughs> so then how are we going to do this? Are we just going to uh, kind of say, you know, put out an invitation and see who um, I guess I, I guess that's the thing that I'm thinking through is like, are there some that we want to meet with, or are we just put going to put out an invitation and say, okay, these are the you know to the different agencies and see who's available, and then the rest get the questions. I guess we we'll put out the invitation, and people who are available can come, and people who are not, maybe they can write up something to us. But we can submit questions to them. Just for clarity, this is just social services. Are we including yes. educators in this? And okay, well, might as well. Uh, I think it, it wouldn't be a everybody. Bad okay, have, like Mary, Mary Custer too. Yeah, someone from the school because we haven't talked to anyone from. We have not. Yeah, system. Uh, we didn't even reach out to Human Rights Commission either. So, okay. This sounds good. I think it will be good, helpful to have their feedback too before we present to town council. What do you think, Russ? What are you thinking? I, I think it would be good to develop some questions, put them out to people, um, get some information as quickly as we can. Uh, so we have some of that information by the time, you know, if we get asked questions during our report to the uh, town council or finance committee. Um, and it may be that we'll, you know, if we do that with each of these organizations, we may get a better picture of who we'd like to have come in and spend some more time talking with us. I like that. 
That sounds good. You want to join us in the sub sub uh, subcommittee, Russ? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Do we have to decide on a time for the subcommittee to meet tonight? Um, yeah, because that's the thing. You need to decide by when you need to have those questions out to the to the agency. No. If we're going to do it that way, because we only have one meeting before that. One week. Yeah. Can I suggest a possible different approach? Sure. If we have a subcommittee, then meetings have to be posted and everything and all in advance. If we ask Brianna to, to write the questions uh, and suggest that others of us consult with her, um, she can consult with any one of us and she can consult with even two of us at once uh, and there's no violation of the open meeting law. Um, so rather than set up a subcommittee, I'd rather ask Brianna to do it and invite her to consult with any and all of us as part of the process. Sounds good. Yeah, that'll be fine. I mean, um, Ms. Toland, you can just like create a draft and then just share it with us and then we can give you feedback, but just have a deadline by when. Okay. Um, yeah, that works for me too. Um, yeah, what I'm thinking, it oh, go ahead. Sorry, just to remind everybody, if we have feedback, we cannot send the feedback to each other. Mm -hmm. That becomes consulting yeah. uh, with each other. We have to just send it to, to Brianna. Yeah, let's just send it to Brianna and a CC to Ms. Moiston. That's yeah. how we'll do it. Mm -hmm. Sounds okay. good. And then if, if anybody, you know, um, if tonight you didn't remember a particular group or individual, you can submit it to Brianna in the future. If there's somebody that we didn't thought about tonight. What about Summit Academy? That's kind of separate from the school, but still in the school. What is that? Say that again. The Summit Academy program. So it's with, where, uh, I don't know the best way to explain it, but it's where some of the children that have um, more behavioral issues who can't stay within the, the daily um, school structure go. And then there's also the building block program, which I just happen to know that a large percentage of our young like elementary school age children get sent to building blocks and then they go from building blocks to Summit Academy. So, um, I, you know. So we're um, talking about special education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well. Sort of. Sort of. I mean, often it's hand in hand, but yeah. it's not necessarily hand in hand. Yeah, it's like what Ms. Boynton said, like the behavioral a lot of times. Yeah. Because oftentimes they are involved with the, with the police, with the law enforcement. You know, the school do call. Yeah. Sometimes parents call for help. Yeah. Very critical uh, population that we didn't reach. You know, I thought about, yeah, about that too. So mm -hmm. thank you for reminding me, <laughs> reminding us. You guys had a lot of work to do in a very we little do. amount of time. And so, yeah. you know. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess um, on a different topic, are we ever going to work on, you know, the visioning uh, thing that Dr. Love uh, recommended? I would very much like to see her actually do the work for the town, you know, and get compensated. She seems to have a good idea of what, you know, should happen. And I say that as part of healing process because there is so much hurt and, um, ill feelings among, you know, BIPOC folks that, you know, a process like that might help. It may, not be, tonight. It may not be tonight, but something for us to think about um, for the town to be aware that they need to budget aside because it's going to take time, it's going, it's going to take resources and, you know, to do it very well with qualified consultant to do it or farm, something like that. Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, I, I agree with that on this. I think it would be great for us to take that up. I think we need to deal with the more immediate issues around persuading the town council to back our recommendations. But before we disband, I would love to see us and first of all, I hope we don't disband, but before our, before our term comes to an end, I would like to see us really talk about it 
I think there's a really important healing aspect to it. And, you know, as um, Michelle and Matthew were talking tonight, I was thinking that part of the problem is that an awful lot of folks in Amherst just don't have any vision or real notion of what would this town look like without white supremacy? What would it look like if, you know, if white people weren't dominant? Uh, and um, I think that's part of the process that Dr. Love was suggesting we uh, initiate. And I think it could be a very powerful piece of what we're doing and in some ways more than what we're doing. I agree. And I think it kind of fits with the second part of our charge too. Um, when the APD came, I, rec I recognize their intention to continue to hear the voices of the community, but there's been several different community forums and healing needs to happen before BIPOC communities are approached for like, I'm not sure how many times at this point, but um, before they share these stories again. Because it seems like there's a there's a history, and even in the last year, there's been three different forums of people sharing painful stories, and people being brave, um, people who could experience retaliation, sharing their stories, hoping that change will come out of it, and nothing happens. And sort of this repetitive theme is, let's do another forum. Before another forum happens, we need to envision what Amherst would look like without white supremacy, and we need to heal. Healing needs to happen. I think. Yeah, that's right. So. Um... I just got a text from someone because I had mentioned what Mr. Ross did at Fort River School, the affinity group. Mr. Ross, if you don't mind, in a nutshell, what you did in that school, instead of me rambling, it would be nice. And I will tell you, a, you know, in my culture, we say it takes a village to raise a kid. And I can't talk enough about wonderful experiences that my kids had at Fort, Fort River School due to Mr. Ross's leadership. You know, they became somebody today. It's, it started at Fort River School. Take it from me. Go, so, take it. Well, you, you don't know Ms. Patton well enough to know what a amazing parent she she is <laughs> what a she made those children what they are but if, if I was able to help that's that's great uh, the short version is that um, we created an opportunity for fifth and sixth graders uh, at lunchtime to meet in racial affinity groups um, I think we had a black group a Latinx group a a uh, Cambodian group, uh, we had a biracial group, and we had a white group. Uh, there may have been others, but those are the ones I remember for sure. Um, and the idea was to have a chance to talk with your peers uh, about what's it like to be part of this identity? What's it like to be part of this identity at Fort River School? What's it like to be part of this identity in Amherst? Um, and I worked with Dr. Ernie Washington at the university and he got some of the athletes and some other uh, students and graduate students of color to come facilitate these groups. Uh, and he and I designed the process together and they met for, I don't know, eight weeks, maybe 10, uh, several years. And then we also had groups where we mixed people from the groups, mixed students together into mixed race groups. So they had an opportunity to hear from each other. Um, and, uh, it was, it was a very interesting thing to do. And, um, um, I, I've heard good reports, but Ms. Pat, it's, it's, it's great to know that it had an impact on your children. I can tell you what it did to my two oldest children, Michael, it put a lot of confidence in him, ended up working at Wall Street. Who does that? And then for my daughter, uh, who is certified public accountant and, and also a real estate uh, uh, developer in Atlanta, I mean, millionaire, that's what who she is, because of a lot of confidence that they got, you know, at Fort River School. I mean, 
we have wonderful teachers and principals in Amen School System there. That formative years for my kids, I can't, I can't, I can't speak enough about it. I'm so grateful. I just want to um, raise that. There are good things that are happening and some people don't get recognized for the work they are doing. Thank you, Mr. Ross. <laughs> It's true, it's true, confidence. It, that's what it, it instilled in my children. That's so awesome. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones, does this program still exist? Is it still up and running? No, uh, no we, we lost our source of facilitators and weren't, weren't able to replace it. Um, I would love it to continue in the school system. I will love it to continue. Another life-changing experience, not for my children, but for myself, is the study circle that was brought to Amherst. Of all groups or things training I've ever done in, my, in, in this town, that was the most life-changing for me. And I, you know, I wish it would come back. I don't even know how to describe it. It was through study circle that we created radar. Mm -hmm. uh, race, yeah. And um, I will hope perhaps with a visioning or some, you know, we just we need study circle for the whole town, like different groups, where people really, you know, um, really speak, you know, from their hearts, no judgment, like very powerful. And uh, it was started by like a um, couple of white women from parents from, from high school. There are a lot of thing, good things that have happened, but it seems like we have short memories about history in this town. And I can go on and on, but I would like those things, good old days, <laughs> to come back. Ms. Moyston. So I don't know how many people are familiar, I, I think to Sheena, but so I just want to say another program that was really helpful for a lot of the youth. I grew up in Village Park, which was like a considered low income or it is low income housing, but we had that it takes a village to raise your family. But the Upward Bound program that I went to and actually Miss Freire, your brother, was my counselor. That's how I know him from there. And, you know, Miss Mary and, and Liz and all of them just kind of follow. We've just been following each other through life. But that program because once you hit like 14 13 14 you, there's no camps available for you um i know that lsse has tried over the years to create like a, a an lit program like a leadership and training program but the kids don't get paid and you know it's i don't know you know they don't it's not like the top choice but the upward bound program and i know that that's through umass but that program is so beneficial <laughs> for the youth and for them to have something to do and they're being educated at the same time. They're, they, we were on the UMass campus, so we definitely thought like we were the, you know, stuff, right? Because we're walking around on campus in summer at night and hanging out with a little bit of taste of freedom of like this college prep life. And I just um, think that those types of programs could be highly utilized now um, for our junior high, early, you know, early high school, high school kids. I remember, um like one of the things that we did was we um um there were study groups that happened at the um, new africa house and when the new africa house was you know running back in the 90s the way it was it was like i remember like looking forward to it um to going um to these groups and it was and it was kind of cool like uh, so <clears throat> one of the things that I really, really miss about this community is um, when I was coming up in the 90s, um, there was a direct connection with UMass and the town of Amherst and the youth of Amherst. Um, and there were things that were happening at UMass that um, the folks from Upper Bound were definitely really um, support and encourage the youth to attend programs that, you know, programs, concerts. Um, you know, I remember um, it didn't necessarily stop um, when school was out. Um, we still had 
um, a number of events that were happening at UMass that was very welcoming. And um, so every once in a while, wear this bright yellow t-shirt from Bright Moments. Bright Moments was a wonderful family oriented um, concert that happened that brought in um, performers from all over the world to, um, you know, share their music with our community, with our, you know, with our local community. And I knew that when it was bright moments, we could definitely, that you, everybody went, like, even if you didn't listen to that type of music, like everybody went, everybody got exposed to it, everybody felt it, you know, um, and I think that, um, especially getting a youth center up and running to really encourage the BIPOC community of UMass and Amherst College to be part of it. And, and that being a place to really include um, like those students to do that kind of work um, with our youth would be great. Also, you know, one of the things that I really remember about the Up or Down program it wasn't just limited to females kind of teaching everybody. Like there were definitely male leaders like Sid who were part of that community who really made sure that looked out for our youth who like our youth could call on if, you know, they ever like were having, you know, anything go on that they were struggling with, whether it be academically or otherwise. Like, and I really feel like, you know, we can look at the history that has gone on <clears throat> in Amherst and we can pull from some of those things that really helped um, along the way and incorporate that into what we're doing now. Um, and then that way, some of the things that unfortunately fell by the wayside can you know, be rekindled, can be rekindled and re, work in a way that that can potentially work better. Um, and so I think that's part of what's really important to remember is like, there are those opportunities out there. And especially now with so many students from UMass in particular, uh, living off campus, you know, there are ways that we can, I think that we can really get them involved. Um, you know, going to football games, going to soccer games, go, you know what I'm saying? Like we can really make this something that works for our community and for what we're, what we're working with in our community. Because at the same time that we have, you know, we have this community of Amherst, but then we have the community of Amherst, like the Amherst that includes all these universities that are in the area, all this. So there, I think there are ways that we can really tap in um, to support our youth, especially our BIPOC youth and our BIPOC families, you know, because a lot of, a lot of those things, I, you know, I remember being able, like my mom being able to bring us to stuff because it was discounted or free because we were associated with, you know, this group or that, you know what I'm saying? Like, so, you know, I remember, my mom ran a children's African dance group and we got to perform at Bright Moments. Like what? You know, like that was something that was really important. And so I, I think that we can really tie these things in, you know, um, like Mr. Vernon Jones, the program that he, you know, started at, at Fort River, like how can we incorporate that, you know, to make that part of, you know, what the further education, what we're doing, you know? And I have to say that, you know, it's really for our youth because at the end of the day, um, you know, I spent way too much time um, over the pandemic on TikTok. But one thing I noticed about TikTok is that our, these young kids that are coming up are so hungry for knowledge and are doing research that like they're finding, they're researching things that like 
I never even knew to look up, you know what I'm saying? And now I'm looking up stuff that I wasn't even, you know, that I wasn't even aware of. And so I think that we have an opportunity to really set forth a community that really sets an example for the rest of this nation. And so we need to make sure we're tapping into that. And part of it is tapping into the history of things that did work, not just the history of things that didn't work. Uh, Ms. Pat, I'll be very, Ms. Ferreira. I'll be very, very quick. So that's, that's one of my vision for CSWG moving forward in addition to us you know, uh, making sure that it's accountability with the CREST program that has been set up and other programs. Also, I'm hoping that we will use this platform to also recommend to the uh, town officials, you know, um, um, things that will prevent crisis in the first place, you know, preventative, uh, you know, uh, programming. And I'm hoping that, um, you know, there was, you know, we can, we can use this platform to do stuff like that, to reach out to like the school system, like this is what has happened in the past, you know, let's, you know, bring it back. There has to be a body like BIPOC majority, you know, directing the town as to what we would like to see that is beneficial for our community. So that's what I'm hoping, you know, this group will do in the future. That's what I want to say. Thank you, Ms. Pat. Um, Ms. Ferreira and then Mr. Vernon Jones. Yeah, I just been looking at the time, you know, even though obviously all of this is wonderful, but I think we need to figure out what we're going to do for the presentation and then the finance committee. So that's all because it's 7.45 and we haven't done anything. And I'm going to have to go soon. <laughs> um, Ms. Ferreira, I hear you. Um, Mr. Vernon Jones, do you want to make your comment or question and then we can move to the next agenda item. Only that I agree with Ms. Ferreira and I'm limited on how long I can stay tonight. Okay, awesome. Um, so the next uh, the next agenda item is the subcommittee. Um, Ms. Bowman and Ms. Walker were on that subcommittee with me and um, we also worked with 7Gen to put start putting together an outline of our presentation for town council. I did reach out to Lynn Griesmer. Um, I hope I'm saying that right. Um, our presentation, the time that we have is 15 to 20 minutes to present, and then we have 15 to 20 minutes for questions and answers. Mm -hmm. What I wanted to bring to the group today is to, to make a decision on who should present, who should do the presentation, or if it's a one person job, a two person job, if multiple people should be involved and what you guys thoughts were on that. Ms. Pat. I think it should be the two co-chairs, if, if that's okay with the group. Does anybody else have thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think it should be two uh, people uh, presenting uh, because obviously, you know, just a one person, it first is not engaging and then two, you know, that's a lot to put on one person. So at least two people, I'm fine with it being the two uh, um, chairs, the, the co-chairs, as long as that's what they want to do. Um, you know, I think we all should be in the, in the, at the meeting though. Um, because obviously there's going to be lots of questions and things like that. So I think we should all be prepared to kind of assist and help out. Um, and then I guess the other question that I have is just around the presentation. Did you all want us to look at that and give any feedback? I mean, I guess that's still a little bit of a question mark to me as to what that looks like. Um, Ms. Moiston, question. Am I breaking open meeting law if I share the presentation that we started putting together with the other group members, or does it have to be in a packet, or? Oh, I can't hear you. Right now, or if you send it out in an email later. Like, if you send it out in an email after the meeting, and then we can put it in next week's packet. Okay, yep. perfect. Yeah, well, if you can send it out, yeah, that would be good. Do you want it, when you send it out? Do you want us to send you any feedback? Of Def definitely. Um, I started the presentation, and there are a lot of blank spots that I we obviously need to go back and put information on. Um, what's there is really an outline. And again, with this, if you guys have any photos that you want to add to the presentation to make it more more like unique to Amherst, I'm all on board for that too. Um, in the presentation, there is 
um, not footnotes, but like presentation notes that are different points that we need to research and put more information in on each slide. So that's why it's a little bit unorganized, but I can definitely send that out to the group after this meeting. Or maybe Friday or something, yeah. Also, uh, oh, sorry, go ahead, Mr. Bernadone. May I? Um, uh, I? I'm very comfortable with our two co-chairs being the primary presenters. Uh, I think everyone on this group is so, has played such a significant role that I would really like, you know, at some point in the report for each of us to get to say one or two sentences, you know, whether it's just why we think this really matters or in some way to hear everyone's voice, uh, I, for me would be important. Um, Ms. Bowman? Um, what I was just going to say is that um, I'm, I think it's great if our two coaches um, present. I would be willing to help with, with presenting, um, but I just have a question about it. So once all the slides are done, right, once we get all the information we need to get on the slides, um, are we basically just presenting off of those slides? Or like, is that what we're doing? Cause like, I'm good with speaking with, you know, prompts, but I, yeah, I'm. So yeah. my, uh, my sort of understanding or like my vision of what the presentation would look like, I personally feel like 15 to 20 minutes is a really limited amount of time for the amount of stuff that we have to get out there. Um, you all will see in the presentation that I send out tonight that we sort of laid the bricks to talk about the historical context of the police and then to talk about the historical presence of the police in Amherst and what white supremacy in Amherst looks like and sort of things that have been building up. Um, so I, I think we should go off of the pre like off of the slides just so we're organized. And yeah, I do agree that we, if we have time, it would be cool if we could all read a sentence and talk about why we joined the committee. But again, I just wanna make sure we have enough time to get through all of the content because it is a lot. And I assume they are probably gonna have some questions. Uh, Ms. Pat? I think it would be very powerful if we include seven gen in the presentation, because I know some uh, town councilors are concerned about the money that was spent on it. I think it will be good for them to actually talk about the work that they did. Um, I don't think any of us sitting here, you know, can do justice to, you know, the work that they did. So I hope we will consider having them as part of the panel. You know, I'm talking about in addition to the two co-chairs, um, maybe reach out to Seven Gen for them to get two reps to join the four primary um, to present. I would like them to do their own presentation, what they did for us. I'm definitely on board with that also. And I think that they'll be able to explain PAR and why they chose PAR and talk about um, their research. Uh, Ms. Walker has her hand up. Um, thank you, Brianna. So um, we actually had a meeting with 7Gen um, to discuss the presentation and we went through all of our we have the outlines of our slides um, already available and we went over that and the order of the slides with them. And we did actually insert two slides specifically dedicated to 7Gen and we left them blank so that they can design what information would go on those slides. And one of them is about how they um, conducted their research. And then the second one would be about their findings and recommendations. Um, so that is, there is an outline for that to happen. The information isn't actually in there now, but <clears throat> once you guys can see the document, you'll see the blank slides there. Did anybody else have any questions about um, the presentation? Ms. Pat? So again, you know, this speaks to who makes decision. We've been meeting for, for months now every week and they're giving us 20 minutes to present and 20 minutes to, why not devote the whole evening? We're talking about BIPOC community in this town, African, African-American, Hispanic, and all different groups, Asian, you know, about our issues. And they're only giving us 20, 
half an hour. I think we should renegotiate. Let them devote the evening for us. We deserve it. If everybody's on board with that, I'm very comfortable with reaching back out and asking for more time. I do think 15 to 20 minutes is just a very short amount of time, even just for our recommendations. Yeah. How's the group feeling about that? They should give us an hour to, to, to do what we want to do and do it very well. And this comes down to who makes decisions. They can't just like, you know, a lot of time for us and say, this is what you work within it. That doesn't fly for me. Uh, Ms. Walker. Um, so I agree with Ms. Pat actually. And I think I would also be interested in seeing if there's a way that we can get more time um, just because I think we have an incredible amount of information <clears throat> and an incredible amount of explaining that we can do. And I think limiting our time really makes us have to pick and choose what we're using. And if we had more time, we could really make a very robust and thoughtful presentation. Um, not that ours wouldn't be thoughtful anyways, but I just think the length of time would really impact the amount of information and the message we can get across. Um, so I would be interested in asking for more time. Um, I'm not sure if that will be a possibility. And then I also just wanted to say that I'm in agreement with Mr. Vernon Jones statement earlier that if it is possible, to have every member like uh, show their face and speak for even just a minute, I think it would be very powerful um, because we are all individuals and very unique. And I think it would be helpful. Um, and having more time would also allow us to make that happen. Uh, Mr. Vernon Jones. I think it would be great for us to have more time if that's possible. When you talk with uh, whoever it is, whether it's the president of the council. Um, I, I would appreciate if you could find out a little more about the relationship between our presentation to the whole town council and our presentation to the finance committee. Uh, and, you know, to what extent we need to repeat things for the finance committee and to what extent we'll have an opportunity to expand uh, on what we've said. And, and also, I don't have any idea how much time we may get with the finance committee, it'd be helpful to know that as well. Um, so this this is a perfect segue. Um, Lynn Griesmer sent me a doodle poll and she, I'm sure other members in the CSWG got that um, doodle poll. I was wondering if before we hop off the meeting, if we could all come to agreement on a time that works best for our entire, in our entire group or as many as possible of us to attend that finance committee meeting. The dates that were proposed were May 26th and May 27th, um, and the time windows were 5.30 to 6.30 and then 6 to 7. And Mr. Vernon Jones, I can definitely um, ask for clarity on the difference between the presentations at the Finance Committee versus the Town Council. When we talked about it, we were talking about that we thought Thursday would be better because we'd have time Wednesday to be in our meeting. Right. I think um, we're Moisten. That was backwards because starting next week we meet on Thursdays. So it was okay. like, can we can we meet on? Can you guys meet with the council and the finance committee on Wednesday the twenty sixth at? I'm sorry, I closed the poll. Oh, I have it up. Um, Five thirty to six thirty or six to seven. Six to seven. Yeah, I, I can't do 5.30, I can do 6 to 7. Okay, and Wednesday works for everyone? Yeah. Yes. Yeah, 6 to 7, yeah. I will respond on behalf of the working group and say that that's the time that works best for us. I also wanted to let you all know, um, I am gonna do my best to attend the finance committee meeting this Thursday, even though we're not presenting, I think it's important that members of the community safety working group hear um, what the APD is wants in their budget and their meeting with the finance committee. I agree. Uh, Mr. Vernon Jones. Uh, Brianna, when you find out the, uh, the Zoom link for that finance committee meeting, could you just share it with all of us? Yes. It's posted on the website too. Also, uh, what time Wait, again? The, 
sorry. What time is the is the meeting on the twenty fourth with the town council? Just so I could put it on my calendar. Um, it's six thirty. Six thirty. And you said it's on the it's on the website, the town of Amherst website. No, it should be under the town on the town calendar. So if you click on, I mean, it should have already been posted by now because it's Wednesday and the meeting is tomorrow. So if you click on 12, I mean, I'm sorry, on May 13th on the calendar, it'll pull up all the meetings for the 13th and mm -hmm. it should include the finance committee. And then the link is right in there. Not that uh, we, I mean, I can send it out to you guys and find it just as easy, but I'm just. I'm okay. Just, yeah. Yeah. Send it to us, please. Yeah. And okay. Oh, go ahead. I just, I have to say for logistical purposes that um, a, it was brought to my attention that people had not received their retroactive pay checks that had submitted their HR paperwork, right? So you would have received two paychecks only for a hundred dollars, um, but you should have received paychecks starting all the way back from December. And so those should be coming out in the next payroll. So we will always be paid during, you guys will always be paid the second pay period of the month. And so that is coming out, that retro payment for those who have submitted their paperwork will come out on the 21st. Thank you, Ms. I, I didn't follow up with that, I'm sorry. I thought it, I didn't, I didn't think I needed to, but apparently I did, so. Thank you, Ms. Weinstein. <laughs> Thank you. Um, did the group have anything else that they wanted to bring up before we move toward leaving? <laughs> um, <laughs> Mr. Vernon Jones. I noticed that uh, Lynn Griesmeer, the president of the town council is in the audience and is, has her hand up. I don't know whether we wanna oh, okay. give her an opportunity to does everybody have time to extend the meeting longer to let her in or um, yeah. are we on a? Yes. Yes. Yes, yeah, that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Um, so I don't want to extend your meeting very long. I just wanted to mention that um, the, so I've been also uh, polling the town council and, in, and we want to make sure that first of all, if we do the evening meeting, it will be for however long it goes. It can be well, be, this is for the finance committee meeting, that it can go well beyond you know, an hour. And so um, right now, the best time for the town council is in fact Thursday at 5.30, maybe six, because uh, I know one of you mentioned that six would be better. Um, so if that was possible um, for the uh, more full discussion with the finance committee meeting, and then I'll work with Brianna to see what we can do with the town council meeting in terms of the time that you're looking for on the 24th. Okay. Thank you. Thank Mr. you. Vernon, thank you. Mr. Vernon Jones. Well, I would propose we meet at the time that the most town councilors can join the finance committee. So that Thursday would be great. I wonder if we could have our meeting uh, on Wednesday. The time we just, we previously said was available to meet with finance. Could we meet with each other? Let's do that. Okay. But still at six then, right? On Wednesday at six? On um, Wednesday at six, or 5.45, yeah. No, I can't. I can't do five forty-five. Can only do oh, six, six, six. I was six. telling you all that. Six. On the twenty-sixth, it would have to be. It would have to be at six. So then we would meet five twenty-six to six p.m. for our regular meeting, and then we would meet at what time on Thursday? With the finance meeting? Five thirty or six, whatever works for you. Deborah? Yeah, I think that's fine. I can do 5.30 or 6, it doesn't matter. Okay, 5.30 is when I have the most counselors now. And uh, there will also be an opportunity. You will. You are going to be the only agenda item that night. Oh, uh, and there'll be an opportunity for you to present, for us to ask questions, and for there to be public comment. 
Okay. Okay. Awesome. Thank you so much for that clarity. Thank you. Thank and, you. Um, Great. Councillor Griesmer, this is an addition to them presenting on the 24th? That's mm -hmm. correct. Okay. Just want and to make I sure. I heard the conversation yeah. about wanting a little more time on the 24th, and I'll see what I can do. That agenda is actually um, much better than um, the agenda for the 17th. So I'm glad we moved it to the 24th. And I'll try to come up with a time certain on the 24th so people aren't waiting around. Okay. okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Great. I just need oh. to know if everybody's going to attend that meeting. So, because on the 24th to present, because I will need to post a meeting if we're, if you guys are all going to meet, I think it would yeah. be best for me to post a meeting. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Okay, so I want a motion to adjourn. Do I have a second? I second it. And I guess we can just do, we can all raise our hand if we're in agreement and then head out. <laughs> Thank you all. Um, I will send the PowerPoint and I'll start working on those questions for social services and people in the community. And I look forward to hearing you guys' feedback on the questions. I need Brianna and Alicia. I just have a quick question. Anybody's welcome to stay, but I, at some point we were talking about questions that Paul had sent or the town manager had sent and then, um, but not everybody had received oh. those questions. And so I wanna make sure that I'm looking at, I, I just want, if Alicia, are you, are you there? Are you there? Yes, and I can forward them to you. Um, they're I in think I have them, but yeah, oh. if you could forward the, but I, just, I don't wanna, I mean, I'm, I just wanna make sure I'm sending the right thing. So yes, please send it to me and then I'll yeah, forward no, it. Yes, it. absolutely, I will do that right away, thank you. That was creepy. Did you hear that? <laughs> well, thank you, everybody. Good night. Thanks. Good night. Thank you. Bye, everybody.